So I guess we're close enough here. Uh, I'm going to kick this off. My name is Trenton Thornock. I'm one of the founders and I'm the managing member of Wyoming Hyperscale. Uh, the title of our presentation is Sustainable Hyperscale Data Center Ecosystem. And I want to put a lot of emphasis on ecosystem because the way that we've approached this development is probably different than how most data center operators approach a development. Uh, we've been operating in this area for six generations. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to avoid using water. That's become a very big issue in the area where we live and indeed uh, the entire Colorado River Basin. And uh, with that, we'll get started. So this is our story. I've already introduced myself. Uh, this is John Gross. He's the president of Jam Gross Engineering. He's also part owner of the company. And Sam Allen, who is uh, with Burns and McDonnell, he is our hyperscale guru. And uh, probably there are lots of you out there who know him already. As far as the overview, um, I like to joke that uh, I started with nothing and I still have most of it left. <laughs> so we are in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming. Uh, we're doing a 30 megawatt phase one in a master planned uh, 120 megawatt campus. The entire 120 megawatts has been procured as of May from Pacific Corp who operate locally as Rocky Mountain Power. So the idea here is to avoid using water or consuming water, uh, we use liquid cooled ITE. Uh, we started off very early on, in fact, before I knew John or Sam, uh, speaking with some folks at OCP, one of whom was just up here, uh, Don Mitchell. So OCP folks have been very generous with their time. Um, I spent time with Mark Danzi. I spent time with Steve Helby. And uh, we've also spent time with Rob Coyle. So there are a whole bunch of uh, folks who are experts, um, some of whom I just met today, uh, like the folks in charge of the heat reuse subproject that we'll talk about a little bit later on. So what we have here is uh, we, we are linked to the primary power grid at this location. Uh, it does have existing renewable generation, so there's uh, more than 500 megawatts, and we've tapped 120 of that. Uh, we have certifications in process uh, by Gensler, who's well-known architect uh, for LEED Gold, and uh, John Gross here is an uh, uptime accredited tier designer. So we are targeting a tier three design, upgradable to tier four. Uh, you'll see that our location here is just inside the border of Wyoming from Utah. So uh, just to the left of the star is Park City, Utah. That's the closest place that most of you have probably visited. It's about 50 miles away as the crow flies. So what we get by going across the border is uh, several things. Uh, first, we don't have to pay the state of Utah 4.9% of our income for eternity. Uh, the tax rate is zero. The property tax rate, which is important for the tenants in the facility who own equipment, is about half what it is in Salt Lake County. So there are some uh, economic drivers there. And uh, so with that, we'll flip to the site rendering. This is what I envisioned would be on this hill, which is the actual spot that we've rendered here. Um, in my mind's eye, it's not flashy. It doesn't look like much. It kind of blends into the hill. And that's by design. We wanted to make sure that uh, from a distance, this facility basically blends into the landscape. So what you see here is on the second floor, all the employee amenities. That's where they'll have their breaks and uh, they have a nice view of the Uinta mountain range from that floor. Uh, so they'll be taking breaks, having lunch, looking at uh, peaks between 10 and almost 12,000 feet. Uh, on the first floor, we have the sock, knock, uh, all the usual uh, parts of the data center that are required from an administrative standpoint. And then in, in the middle where we have the vans parked, uh, that is the dock area. The docks are actually on the other side. Uh, so we have a sequential flow for all the material that comes 
into the facility, unloaded at the docks, unboxed, uh, climatized, programmed, burned in, and then taken into the data halls. So in this rendering, we've got uh, three data halls. Those are 10 megawatts each. So everything in this development is modularized. Uh, this 30 megawatt development, again, is broken down into 10 megawatt blocks. Those 10 megawatt blocks are further broken down into two megawatt blocks. And the idea there is that uh, we can avoid overbuilding by progressively building out uh, the space as tenant demands occur. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sam. Thank you, Trenton. So I am Sam Allen. I'm the director with uh, Mission Critical at Burns and Mac and get the privilege of talking to you a little bit more about the details of this project, this building and plant, and the ITE environment. So as Trenton mentioned, we are targeting an uptime tier three uh, redundancy profile. So we are concurrently maintainable all the way to the rack level. So you'll see that through the mechanical, electrical, and all supporting services throughout, throughout the design. He also touched on we're targeting a PUE of 1.08. Uh, and that's largely attributed to the fan savings that you would see in a traditional data center and the fact that we have no compressors whatsoever uh, in this facility. So you also see up here that we have no refrigerant on site. Uh, and it's very important. In fact, the only refrigerant that may be possible on site would be part of the break room refrigerator. And even then, we're looking at alternative sources there too. From a utility perspective, uh, up to 50% of the annual consumption, uh, we already have commitments to 50% of that being from solar and wind and still exploring other alternative sources there too, including nuclear power. Uh, as, as Trenton introduced, introduced the project, uh, and you'll, you'll notice here in this cutaway, you don't see outside plant equipment, right? So we don't have any water consumption. So it is liquid cooled and we'll talk about the plant in just a moment but we're doing some unique things there and we're not using any water consumption whatsoever in this project profile. And finally, even the batteries are a target of alternative uh, thinking and critical thinking. So we are implementing nickel zinc batteries in this environment here too. This project starts to sound a lot like a project of knots, right? We're not using fans, we're not using compressors, we're not using refrigerant, we're even doing things differently from a battery perspective. So what are we doing? What we are doing is coupling the heat rejection with an underground aquifer exchange and using heat hosts and identifying heat hosts for energy recovery. So specifically those heat hosts um, in this project will be a, an indoor farm or one of the heat hosts will be an indoor farm. And so that's why I'm in hyperscale indoor farms and you'll hear more about that later in this presentation. Um, but for every megawatt worth of ITE cooled or heat rejected, we're able to grow an acre of food. Uh, the, at that point, the aquifer, the exchange, becomes a balance point. So we're balancing the heat of rejection and that load profile against those indoor farms and that load profile of other heat hosts. Um, as it might be apparent, or maybe not, this project becomes climate independent or climate agnostic. We've heard a lot about uh, temperature extremes in the news recently, both the highs and the lows. But because we're coupled with a, a geocouple or geothermal exchange, we're agnostic to those fluctuations entirely. So an N equals 20 and N equals 50 isn't going to influence, or excursions beyond that, isn't going to influence the performance of the data center. And I'll pause there because that's a huge um, benefit to this project type. The other piece that I'll draw your attention to is thinking critically about our infrastructure. So our heat hosts are pretty well defined. There's examples of those in indoor farming, in lumber drying facilities, in distilleries, in uh, foam blowing. But we're, we also take a critical thought process towards the um, components of the data center themselves. So those generators are water jacketed. The load banks that are required for commissioning and annual testing and, and monthly maintenance are water cooled. All of that heat that we typically would reject to the ambient is recovered and put back into the uh, heat exchange. So we're able to reuse even some of that preventative maintenance um, excess in our heat exchange. At a ITE environment, a data hall level, all of those choices allow us to use and support all types of advanced cooling technologies and systems in accordance with OCP. So we are agnostic on technology at the rack level or the ITE cooling level. We can use immersion, we can use rear heat exchangers, we can use cold plates. 
It really doesn't affect the performance of the facility because it's agnostic with the choices we've made so far in the design. Along those lines, we can uh, design and accept any type of facility water ranges. We can control each of the rows, the pod rows, from a thermal perspective and a temperature perspective such that we can export heat in a very specific manner and at strategic exits to our heat recovery highway. So as we evaluate the grade of heat we're getting back from a rejection perspective, we can take it off at strategic points, all allowing us to have a recovery system that's capable of recovering anywhere from 32 to 70 degrees C. Very wide, very agnostic system design. Uh, a lot of details are left out in that overview on purpose, uh, but we will be around later on if you have questions about it. But I do want to turn it over to John now to talk about the thumbprint OCP has um, left on this project. Thank you, Sam. Uh, he always makes it hard to follow him because he speaks so well, uh, eloquently. Um, so as Sam mentioned and, uh, and Trent alluded to as well before, uh, OCP has had a, uh, a place at the table in this project since its inception uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, in addition to being uh, the liquid cooling expert for the project and the uh, mechanical engineer of record, I, one of my additional roles is I'm one of the co-leads for the ACF project here within OCP. So we talk about OCP cooling environments and there's five projects, right? We have advanced cooling facilities, we have the immersion ACS, cold plate, rear door, and we have heat reuse. Each one of those actually has a place within this project uh, with our current design and configuration and intent. If you go back and you look at ACF, which is obviously my, uh, my, my playground, if you will, um, we have published in the last year and a half two uh, white papers that talk about the guidelines for the connections between the ACS systems and the facility water system, as well as the distribution guidance and reference design. We'll get into those a little bit and how they've, they've factored into the project. We also have two additional work streams that are currently underway right now, and that's BIM standards for advanced cooling solutions products, as well as the physical parameter survey of the ACS products. And we'll talk a little bit about those. So the three ACS systems, as we all know, are door heat exchanger, cold plate, and immersion. Uh, as uh, Sam mentioned, each one of these solutions is able to be integrated into the facility. Now, a lot of folks might be thinking, okay, we're, we're designating a data hall for door heat exchangers, we're designating a, a, a data hall for immersion, we're designating a, a data hall for cold plate. We are not. We can, with our infrastructure, plug in a door heat exchanger set of racks immediately adjacent to several immersion tanks on the same row if we so choose. Um, Trenton will talk a little bit about SLAs and, uh, and leasing agreements, so um, you know, we'll get into that a little bit more. But the idea was to try to make sure that we were not in a technology lock as we design and build this facility for today, for the tenants that are coming in today, or for five, 10, however many years down, down the line. Another key th aspect is that we're gonna be evaluating the project against the OCP Ready ACF co-location site assessment checklist, which is currently under development. Actually had a really good meeting yesterday with, uh, with the team on, on the progress for that, and we uh, hope to have a draft of that, uh, that site assessment done uh, by the end of 22 with a presentation to be done potentially at the, uh, the regional summit in Prague in April. Um, so with that, go into how are we using some of the, the work product from OCP into, into the project design. So this is one of the, the tables that, uh, that came out of the liquid cooled connections um, documentation and reference design. So this looks like a, a pretty good prescriptive table. It's not really intended to be prescriptive so much as it is kind of a cheat sheet. Uh, it's basically going and taking uh, energy standard recognized limits for pipe flow rates and velocities, correlating it to FWS delta T's to give folks a quick glance of if my pipe size is this and my FWS delta T is this, how much capacity could I theoretically support at that set of connections? So these types of, of attributes are integrated into the system design. We get into BIM standards. So BIM standards, as I mentioned, is an active uh, uh, work stream right now. Uh, we're currently trying to, uh, to get the, the parametrics for the BIM standards pulled together and issued in draft out for review. What we've been doing on our end is we've been heavily utilizing BIM during the design process to 
gear ourselves towards a, a system design where we can, during the design phase, ensure that we have optimized our pipe routing, our locations, our connection locations, make sure we've got our concurrent maintainability factored in there, look at all of our clearances, so on and so forth. But the other thing that we're doing with it is we're using it to help evaluate whether or not we have the ability to easily change the infrastructure in the future as there are inevitable uh, changes in the, uh, the technology that we're trying to connect to the facility. So you can see here in, in, the, um, in this image here, which is actually, a, this is a screenshot from our uh, design model, I can share that with you. We've stripped a bunch of important stuff out, but that, <laughs> that is a screenshot from it. Uh, but one of the things you may notice is we've, we're using groove piping solutions. One of the reasons we're using groove piping solutions is because it is very easy with a groove piping solution if you need to change the size of a tap on your, your header to close your segmentation valves on your concurrently maintainable loop and disconnect your groove couplings, pull a T out, put a new T in, you're done, no hot work in the space, so on and so forth. So that's part of our, uh, our emphasis on flexible infrastructure and extending the useful life. Another part that came out of OCP, the liquid distribution guidance and reference designs. Again, this is actually an excerpt from the, uh, the white paper and, and the publication. This is showing some of the valve train uh, for the recommended connection methodologies for the ACS solutions to the FWS. Um, so we've got balancing valves, we have vents, drains, strainers, so on and so forth, all those things that, that we know need to go into these connections. Additionally, you'll also notice here, we've got threaded connections and we've got uh, grooved connections or flange connections. So that's all based on pipe size, that's all part of the white paper and the, the, the guidance that's been, been issued to date. Um, and we are following all of those. So BSPP threads for threaded connections, uh, and then in our case, we're choosing to use couplings uh, for the larger connections. Prefabrication util utilizing BIM. Uh, a lot of folks have different names for this. We're using the, the name prefabrication. Basically what we're doing is we're going through this process to lay out the entire data hall, lay out all the MEP infrastructure, including the supporting steel for, uh, for part of our uh, ITE space. And then we're gonna go and take that and work with an integrator, and that integrator is going to prefabricate and pretest the skids that are gonna go into the data hall before they ever ship out. Now we're not just doing that on the data halls. We're also doing that in the mechanical galleries where our CDUs exist. So, in a typical data hall, we have, we have space for 120 uh, immersion tanks that are 48OU, okay? So if you think, go through all the, the variations and all the requirements for connecting 120 immersion tanks in that type of environment, you have approximately 7,340 pipe joints in a single 10 megawatt data hall. With the design that we're using and the prefabrication processes that we're using that OCP is, is trying to advance, we have cut the number of field joints down to 20. Okay, so the amount of labor that is actually saved for an eight person crew has gone from three months for a single 10 megawatt data hall to one week per our contractor. So obviously that labor is being done somewhere else, but it's being done in a climate controlled, secured environment where folks are not having to worry about commuting through the Wyoming winter to get to work. They're not having to drive and burn all the fuel to get there, so on and so forth. So there's time savings, there's carbon emission savings, there's easier manpower, there's higher uh, quality control, so on and so forth. We're also gonna be able to uh, reduce the on-site labor for commissioning. How are we gonna do that? I mentioned we're not just doing this in the data hall for the immersion tanks, we're doing it for the CDUs and the mechanical gallery. We're also doing it for the UPSs in the UPS rooms. So we've got centralized UPSs with this particular design as opposed to BBUs. What we're doing is we're actually skid packaging parallel capacity UPSs and their battery backup systems and the output switch gear all on skids, assembling it, load bank testing it at the factory, testing the battery monitoring system, doing all those load profile tests, doing all of our needed testing on our switch gear and breakers and so on and so forth. And then we're disconnecting a shipping split, putting it on a truck, sending it up to Wyoming. The other thing that's kind of unique about this facility, and again, it goes back to that flexibility discussion, right? The way that we have this uh, configuration set up, every single individual row, and a single row is, is capable of supporting a peak of 1.2 megawatts, on average one megawatt per data hall. Each uh, individual row can actually operate on a different TCS fluid. 
So we've actually been working with the, uh, the various groups within OCP to understand where the industry is going for some of the different fluids. There is a unified uh, immersion fluid spec that is in development right now. We're paying very close attention to that. We're looking at materials compatibility for our products that are in the piping and so on and so forth and designing it so the infrastructure can take those types of solutions. Now we get down to some of the direct impacts of liquid cooling. Okay, so we've heard a lot about liquid cooling so far today. We're only halfway there, I'm sorry. Um, but one of the things that Sam mentioned is a target PUE of 1.08. Well, how do we get to a 1.08? Well, one of the key ways that we get there, as Sam mentioned, is we have the aquifer heat exchange. So we don't have any refrigeration. We don't have any compressors, uh, compressors that we have to deal with. We have pumps that are pumping out of the aquifer. We're injecting back into the aquifer. That's it. That's, that's it, we've got water circulation going on, and that, that is all. We've also eliminated the server fans in the scenario where a tenant decides to deploy uh, immersion, right? So obviously we can support any of the three different ACS solutions, but if we go, if we see immersion across the board in the data halls, which is a very distinct possibility, in a scenario where we see that, if you look at the typical parasitic power draw from server cooling fans in an air-cooled deployment, Okay, they can average anywhere from about 10 to 15 percent of the total server power draw. So what that means is a 30 megawatt data center running single phase immersion is actually using all 30 megawatts worth of UPS capacity to perform compute network and storage. In an air-cooled environment, it's doing somewhere between about 27 and 25 and a half to 27 megawatts worth of actual functional work. So we're actually getting, from a pure performance and a flops uh, output perspective, we're actually getting more performance out of the data center than an air-cooled equivalent. The other thing we're doing, you know, Sam mentioned the big one, right? Big, big heat reuse one is the, uh, the indoor farm. It has a huge impact both from an energy perspective but also from an ESG perspective, which Trent will, will touch on here in just a minute. But we're also doing all the obvious stuff, right? We're in Wyoming. So in Wyoming, um, it gets a little cold during the winter. So winter dry bulb design temperature is somewhere in the ballpark of around minus 30 uh, Celsius. Um, so guess what? We've got HVAC heating for the building proper. Got to do that. So we're using data center uh, heat recovery to heat the data center. We're also using it for snow melt. We're using it for heat tracing all of our outdoor or underground lines that are uh, uh, at potential risk. Okay. And then obviously we've got hot water. We'll use it for preheating of the domestic hot water or if we have uh, users that are actually rejecting hot enough water uh, from their uh, ACS solution into the facility, we can actually do all of our domestic water heating with the waste heat. And so with that, I'll turn this back over to Trenton to talk about our heat reuse. Sure, so uh, this is where it gets interesting and this is something that we're able to do because we're developing on a large chunk of property that we already own and we are already in the agriculture business. So uh, Wyoming Hyperscale Indoor Farms is owned by my sister-in-law. I'm the consulting CFO, whatever that means. And uh, we have decided that we'll do 30 acres of indoor produce in a greenhouse along with phase one. We're still talking to folks that own technology for heat reuse cases for the other 90 megawatts that will come in the next phase. Uh, we're under NDA with folks who do uh, direct from air carbon capture, uh, wood drying. Uh, you can do almost anything with uh, 150 degree water. You can even start to bake bread. You can't finish it, but you can start. Um, the point behind this part of the development was to help feed the Wasatch Valley and provide fresh produce from an area that currently gets its produce from the Central Valley of California, which is currently very stressed. So we have fresher produce by eight to 10 hours, and that's on top of uh, the cold storage distribution latency time. And all, all that time detention gets eliminated. And more importantly, for someone who spent most of their career as a CFO like me, the cost gets eliminated. One of the other bonuses that John pointed out is uh, if we stock trucking from California, uh, each way we're, <clears throat> excuse me, gonna burn about 70 gallons of diesel. So that's about 1,570 pounds of CO2. So for each round trip that we eliminate, 
we're eliminating 1.5 tons of CO2. <clears throat> Around, excuse me, decarbonization. <clears throat> what we see here is the uh, actual photos of the area. So that windmill is tied to a switch gear which collects energy from those four existing wind farms. It converges all of that wind generation on the grid. It used to be excess. I'm not sure if there is still excess after we took 120 megawatts. But in any case, <clears throat> we're collecting renewable energy directly from the grid. There are no power purchase agreements. There are no paper swaps, things that C, you know, CFOs love. Uh, we're, we're not doing any financial en engineering or uh, greenwashing. We're actually plugging into that switch gear. We got a nice surprise at the end of November last year uh, when Bill Gates and TerraPower announced that they're building the uh, Natrium Advanced Nuclear Plant in Kemmer, Wyoming. That is approximately 30 miles north of the wind switch gear. And at that point, uh, the last existing coal plant at the Naughton facility will be retired and decarbonized with advanced nuclear. So some of the other things that we're doing during construction are carbon footprint tracking. It's a very complex process. Fortunately, we found a vendor who can uh, plug directly into our BIM models. And we have to do a little bit of work to put in the types of materials that we're using in construction, but we will have life cycle uh, carbon management tracking from the get-go, and that's already started uh, when the dozers moved in January. Uh, I've talked a little bit already about the energy sourcing. Uh, we've talked about the refrigerant-free site and the skid packaging, so I'm going to skip all of that. except to say that this is just the beginning. And uh, although I'm unable to disclose our counterparty, uh, what I am able to tell you is that uh, phase one has become a template for future projects. And we currently plan to build essentially what is a carbon copy of phase one, which includes the liquid cooled data center paired with indoor farms on the back end for heat reuse and aquifer heat exchange in Tucson, Arizona and in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and I guess the question is, you know, why? Why did you decide to do heat reuse? Uh, why did you take on the additional risk of trying to develop something outside the four walls of the data center? And it really, boils down to economics. Without the data center as a heat source, indoor farming in that area is not practical from an economic standpoint because the heating cost is too high. Uh, the electricity up there would be about seven cents per kW during the winter, and it would basically eliminate all the profit from the indoor farms. So what we plan to do is to uh, transfer that heat to the indoor farms. The farms will then buy it at a pro forma of about uh, three cents per kW therm equivalent and pay that back to the data center. So assuming that the farms only consume therms about half the year because they won't need as much uh, heat in the summer, that can simply be uh, rejected on the loop. So heat hosts are not required to run the data center. We didn't want to create a, a dependency there. So it's completely independent, but on an annual basis, uh, the data center tenants at 120 megawatts will get a credit for about $4 million, 4.2 million to be exact. Megawatts. That's at 30 megawatts. At 30 megawatts, $4.2 mag million, dollars, and over 10 years, you know, that's a $42 million paycheck going back to the data center tenants. Uh, speaking of those tenants, the annual savings from elimination of all the fans and about 95% of the electricity load that would go to HVAC systems in an air-cooled data center, uh, we're gonna be saving about $30 million a year. So over 10 years, that's $300 million. It's significant. And uh, 
I've often wondered where the block is in advancing liquid cooling, and I think it might be somewhere between uh, engineering and the CFO's office. Because if someone would have brought uh, a savings proposal to me and, and told me, well, it's, you know, it's not really one, two, three, five percent, it's more like 40 or 50 percent, that would get my attention. First of all, I wouldn't believe them. <laughs> I'd say, you gotta prove this to me. But uh, in our case, we've developed it from scratch, essentially, and uh, these gentlemen are extremely talented in their respective areas of expertise. We've been able to move fast, so uh, you're basically looking at project control. Uh, if we need to make changes, uh, we're hoping for some good questions now because we haven't started pouring concrete for uh, the data halls. We can still make changes. So with that, I'll take your questions. Well, and real quick, sorry, before the questions, uh, I did want to touch on this slide, our uh, ubiquitous uh, OCP call to action slide. So as I talked about a little bit earlier in, in that segment, uh, within the Cooling Environments Project, we have the, those five different uh, sub-projects. There are a lot of work streams that are either active right now or are uh, in incubation right now, and we're looking for contributors to that. So please, 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 if you're interested in any of these topics, please reach out to uh, any of the Cooling Environments leadership, any of the uh, um, Cooling Environments uh, sub-project leads. Let us know. We are looking for uh, enthusiastic contributors. Um, so with that, does anybody have any questions? Uh, thank you so much for the great presentation, uh, Kai from UL. Um, uh, for the EPC project, right, this is really impressive. For immersion cooling, since it's new, I need special permitting required for the project. So the question was around uh, permitting? Permitting, yes. Yeah, so what is the regulation requirement from the permitting side? Yeah, we are developing in an unincorporated part of Uinta County, Wyoming. So uh, we have a couple of regulatory bodies. Uh, the first one is Uinta County. There's no munis municipal government. There's no municipal code that we have to deal with out here. Um, so those approvals were obtained in February of uh, 2021. We later amended the project location uh, in September of last year. So that takes care of the local approval. We also went to the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality and the Industrial Siting Division. And uh, because of the total project spend on phase one, uh, we obtained what's called a letter of non-jurisdiction and uh, a nice cover letter from uh, the office wishing us luck with the project. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much, appreciate it. Hi, my name is Shankar from Danfoss. Uh, excellent work, I mean, it's really interesting to see all the stuff you're doing. Just one uh, curiosity because uh, in my initial stages of my career, I was designing ground source heat pumps and ground loop heat exchangers. And it was very important how to balance using the earth as a source and sink throughout the year so that over the years you don't uh, change the temperatures. So how are you going to deal with rejecting heat continuously to the aquifers and not taking heat from there at all? So uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So we have done some preliminary uh, geothermal modeling uh, with our geothermal expert. And with the aquifer design, we're extracting the water out of the ground uh, at the project site. We're actually injecting it back into the ground about two miles away over near the indoor farm, which happens to be downstream on the aquifer. The initial studies as of right now show that if we are running at 120 megawatts for 30 years with zero heat offtake, we will see a temperature rise of approximately one degree centigrade in the aquifer. Uh, the same question, uh, uh, but in an another way. Um, I love uh, your idea to use uh, geothermal as uh, heat storage, uh, but uh, 100 megawatt it's a lot. And uh, do you calculate how much in time it can cover uh, the dot center heat rejection. And uh, second question is um, uh, Wyoming is uh, there is any seismic uh, issue and if there is a, that issue, how you handle it or do you have any measures for that? 
so on the uh, on the topic of the the time and the the heat soak, right? So we were saying you know one degree centigrade over the the thirty years. The other thing that I forgot to mention into that is uh, we are still doing some um, uh, some water uh, studies, uh, some borehole studies and whatnot to look at the recharge rate of the aquifer. So the study that we that I just mentioned actually assumes no regeneration of the aquifer at all. Um, so we have a, it is a massive aquifer that is uh, several hundred feet deep um, and spans uh, quite a number of miles underneath us. Uh, so we have quite a bit of heat rejection into the, the surrounding uh, bedrock. Uh, so we've got a lot of thermal capacity there. Um, and, and then I, I'm sorry, David, I didn't quite catch the second question. Uh, second question is about any seismic uh, activity. I mean, any yes. seismic issue in uh, Wyoming or no? So that, that's actually a fantastic question. It's been very much on our minds right now uh, on this project and actually ever since uh, we started, uh, Trent and I started together about 18 months ago. So um, we are looking at two possible solutions to that. We're still evaluating which one is the, the preferred method right now. So one of the challenges that we have run into in, in discussing um, various liquid cooling solutions with a number of different manufacturers that are engaged with the project is nobody's really done any uh, in-depth, detailed seismic testing yet. So we are actually making it part of the project where we are, we are engaging a seismic lab and we are going to take some equipment to the seismic lab and shake table test the, the equipment with IT equipment in the racks, in the immersion tanks while we're doing the seismic testing and actually looking for uh, dropped packets, any kind of indication that the IT is being disturbed. So we have the, uh, the seismic studies that indicate what our um, maximum expected uh, earthquake is. Um, and we're, look, we're basically gonna compare the results of that shake table testing against that design earthquake. And if the, um, if the indications from the shake table testing are that we can't withstand that earthquake, the plan is to go with a base isolation foundation system for the data center. Um, if it turns out that the equipment can handle that design earthquake, uh, we're gonna save ourselves about uh, eight figures worth of money and quite a bit of construction time by eliminating that. Thanks, yeah. thanks a lot. Right, so if we backed up to the slide that uh, Sam showed at the cutaway, the data hall, uh, it actually shows the seismic isolation design. Uh, that's by a firm called Pharrell Elsesser out of San Francisco. Uh, they did the seismic isolation for Lawrence Livermore National Labs, uh, and their exascale compute facility, as well as uh, a lot of facilities in the Salt Lake Valley and uh, others in the Bay Area. I had just one question about uh, access to the aquifer. So what analysis or provisions are you putting in place if someone like yourself comes in and puts in another site, right, that's using the resources of that aquifer? Right, so that's governed by the Wyoming State Engineer's Office. Uh, the state of Wyoming adopted wholesale the EPA's guidance around class five wells. So because it's a non-consumptive well, the permitting process is actually quite easy because we're not appropriating any groundwater and sending it into the atmosphere, otherwise using it. So it comes out of the ground, <clears throat> it picks up heat, it dumps some heat at the farms and then it goes right back into the same aquifer. Uh, that permitting process took us about 10 days. Our hydrologist happened to get a, his uh, hydrology degree from the University of Wyoming. And uh, so he knows the area quite well. In fact, there's a, a town in Wyoming named after his family. So uh, th that there again, we ran into uh, a bit of luck or serendipity in that uh, the state of Wyoming has taken a pretty liberal stance on uh, permitting this type of well. And I think to, to add on to that, so Trenton touched on the permitting part, which is obviously very important. Um, I also want to touch on the thermal saturation part uh, as well, because that's obviously another consideration. So as I mentioned before, our, our current hydrology studies are indicating a, a, a one degree C rise over 30 years with zero offtake, zero regeneration, and the 120 megawatt load. So what we're doing is we've actually designed our, uh, our heat exchangers and the, uh, the, des the systems that are interfacing with that aquifer supply water for a five degree C rise uh, and still be able to hit all of our design temperatures. So if nobody else plugs in, we can theoretically go for 150 years with no regeneration and no heat offtake. Um, so while we don't have really a, you know, something where we can say absolutely in black and white that we're perfectly in the clear because you never know what's gonna happen, we've built a pretty hefty safety factor into the, the design of our, our systems. 
And it's unlikely that we're going to have any nearby neighbors. Uh, there are about 12,000 acres inside the fence line on this ranch. It's like a checkerboard, and uh, we control the private property. Of course, we do the surface lease from the state of Wyoming and uh, the federal government, the Bureau of Land Management. Um, but those areas are not accessible under Wyoming law without uh, authorization from the landholder. So it, it would be very difficult for anyone to get within three or four miles of our facility. We got about 30 seconds left. We got uh, just one last, last question, I think. So uh, when you look at the form factor or the space footprint for like a coal plate, a liquid cooler, an immersion tank, uh, they're very different. Like the immersion tank is essentially a rack tipped on the side, right? When you're building a facility that is optimized for all of these different technologies, how do you think about like space optimization? Like, are you optimizing for one kind of a rack more than a tank, maybe? So that's that's a great question, and I think the the answer to that is when you're trying to accommodate all three uh, today, given the variances in form factors, you can't really optimize around any one. Um, and so what we did look at is typical densities that we see in immersion tanks versus cold plates and, and rear door deployments to look at making sure that we can accommodate a, a nice uniform building block with minimal wasted space down the length of the rows. Uh, fortunately, the depths of the solutions are, are fairly, uh, fairly consistent, so that made the row spacing a lot easier to deal with. Uh, but yeah, it's, the, the more flexible you want to be, the harder it is to, to truly optimize to the, to the nth degree. Thank you.